with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, February 12th, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Lainey Newman, research assistant at Harvard Law School, author of Rust Belt Union Blues, Why Working Class Voters Are Turning Away from the Democratic Party, written with Theta Scopel. Also on the program today, Israel begins its bombing of the 1.5 million Gazans in Rafah, killing 70 to rescue two hostages. Also on the program today, Biden, once again, seems upset this time with Israeli plans to expel Palestinians from where they told Palestinians to go for refuge. Donald Trump announces he would encourage Russians uh, a, a Russian attack on NATO countries who aren't keeping up with their dues. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. Senate close to passing a supplemental foreign war bill for Ukraine and Israel. Poll 86% of Americans think Joe Biden is too old to be president. 62% think the same of Donald Trump. Meanwhile, in New York's third, tomorrow will be the special election to replace George Santos. House Republicans planning to attempt to impeach DHS Secretary Mayorkas once again tomorrow night. Chief witness against Matt Gates is now apparently testifying to the Congressional Ethics Committee. And former PTI members win in the official count of the Pakistani vote. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us uh, on this uh, day. Well, in this office, obviously, it's the day after the Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. It's a miracle I'm here. And uh, Emma's still uh, you know, barely breathing. Um, but here she is. Yeah. Hey, hey. Um, <clears throat> last night was, f I had a little too much fun and I didn't do any of the things I was supposed to do, like z or drink liquid IV. I just was like tweeting, Mahomes is amazing. Mahomes is amazing over and over again. Um, but that was really how my, uh, my night went. He really is amazing. He's amazing. I can't even get over it. Well, there you go. That's it. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. That's all I have to contribute. Also, yeah, uh, Biden. They did not go descend onto the field and endorse Biden in the uh, in. in it was oh, odd. phase one. Advisor. It's just if it, that, that was just phase one. We moved into phase two of the psyop. So yeah. get ready. Yeah. yeah. What happened? I was waiting for the whole uh, vote Biden thing at the end. It didn't come. Well, now Ice Spice gets installed as vice president, and uh, <laughs> Biden's gonna get it. It's gonna be a, a fifty-state landslide. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot about the Ice Spice angle. Ooh. She's got the ginger. Uh, uh, I, there's another covered. pop star. Ice Spice was yes. in the booth in the, in next the booth. to Taylor Swift last. Okay, week. of course, it's, it's and, really gonna change a lot. And yeah. um, did they uh, bust Usher for his uh, subliminal messages about uh, voting for Biden? And the I didn't, I didn't see that. that I didn't like see the halftime like show. Every like it's uh, tough because they want to do the vote for Biden stuff, but they also want to a fit enough like um, diabolic sacrifice of children stuff in there. And there's only so much time in the halftime show. That's true. Also, That's Kowalski true. just I am'd in that he he bet fifty dollars on the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl a little while ago, and I, we just made him four hundred and twenty-five dollars. Wow. 
Look at that. What, what kind of odds are those? Yeah, well, it was it, no. I mean, they must have been at the start of the playoffs or at the start of the season or something wow. like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Um, we will uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the Super Bowl stuff uh, as we get into the fun half. <laughs> there was a really sort of, uh, um, I mean, uh, I thought incredibly cynical ad that was uh, yep <laughs> um, purchased and uh, created. By the uh, Kennedy Super PAC, which, of course, has absolutely no contact with uh, Kennedy himself, mm -hmm. 100%. And uh, so he has no responsibility whatsoever for that ad. Um, that he now has pinned to hit the top of his Twitter account? I mean, <laughs> I'm sure a an intern did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Uh, as it were. But um, we'll, we'll get into that later in the program. Um, there was another ad that ran during the Super Bowl last night. I did not see this one myself. Uh, but it was an, an ad uh, fr by the state of Israel uh, that was run. Money's fungible, of course. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if it was actually part of the aid that we've given them to provide a $7 million purchase uh, uh, ad during the Super Bowl. But while the ad was running, uh, they began their bombing assault on Rafa. Again, Rafa is a city in the southern uh, tip of Gaza that borders uh, the Egyptian uh, Sinai uh, desert. And normally has about 300,000 people in the city. Again, Gaza in and of itself, the densest um, uh, place on earth in terms of population. 300,000 people in the city. It is now home to about 1.4 million. Um, many, many of those in uh, tents set up by the UN. And uh, now Israel is now bombing that area looking to what they call evacuate uh, these um, these people. Let me just read this quote really quickly about what it was like in Rafa last night. This was from an Al Jazeera contributor. The screaming and wailing nearly drowned out the warplanes that covered the sky, dropping barrages in a fiery belt that crushed the bodies of d the displaced in their tents. Um, so just the point is just that the people that were bombed and killed last night, many of them were literally like, there's no place to go. They're sheltering in tents as refugees. And that's how they spent their last moments. Uh, here is, um, Bibi Netanyahu, who of course was on, uh, Fox news. This was on, uh, last night. He was on ABC uh, I, as I'm well, sorry. Yeah. too. So this he's is, doing the American he's doing the rounds, media rounds. Yeah. Um, as a way, I guess, ostensibly of pushing back on the sort of mild, mild criticism uh, that Joe Biden launched, as in, they're a little bit over the top. <laughs> That's how I describe like a Baz Luhrmann film, not a potential genocide. <laughs> um, but here is uh, Netanyahu on with uh, Fox's Shannon Bream. Okay, so let's talk about Rafa. You've uh, told your military, got to evacuate that area. Critics of this say that hundreds of thousands, maybe more than a million people, have evacuated from elsewhere in Gaza to that location. One former U.S. envoy saying these people have nowhere to go and no way to get there. So, again, you talk about total victory, but at what cost and where do you expect these people to go? Have the Egyptians said anything to you about this? Because they're publicly saying if those people start crossing the border, it potentially upends your peace agreements with Egypt. We have uh, uh, cleared out and uh, conquered and destroyed most of the uh, uh, Hamas terrorist infrastructure in the rest of the Gaza Strip. So now there's plenty of room north of Rafa for them to go to. And that's where we're going to direct them. Uh, and, and again, urge them and direct them to do so with flyers, with cell phones and with safe corridors and other things. So uh, we see things differently. We've managed to do it up to now. And this is the directive that I gave the army right now. I think the people who are uh, telling you, uh, oh, you can't do it, uh, you can't go into Rafa under any conditions are basically saying, uh, don't win, lose. And if we lose, everybody loses, you lose too. Because this is a battle against the Iran terror axis. This is a battle of the forces of civilization against the worst forces of barbarism on the planet. We have to win, not only for our sake, 
but for the sake of our common civilization. And it just has to be, you just have to continue <laughs> purposefully, methodically, and responsibly, and we're going to do it. And by the way, this position is not just mine. It's the people of Israel. People don't understand how united the people are, how brave and determined our soldiers are across politi the political spectrum. People understand that we have no choice but to win this war because our very future, and in many ways the future, the future of peace and prosperity in the Middle East depend on this. If we don't <laughs> defeat Hamas, then the worst things will happen. If we defeat Hamas, then I think not only will we have uh, peace and prosperity, I think the circle of peace will expand dramatically. I said that uh, when we did the Abraham Accords before we... Oh, geez. Uh, I, don't, I mean, um, you may want to interject in there at one point, Shannon Bremer. She just seems so, um, like, uh, ecstatic uh, the, at, the, at the answer. It's impressive you can say go north without a smirk on his face. Um, the, I think the point that should be taken, though, of this is that it is the Israeli people. Yeah. Um, that there is something still like uh, hovering in the high 70s uh, support for this assault on Gaza and uh, the Gazan people, really. Um, the people who are saying you can't do this are also the same U.S. intelligence officials who say they haven't come close to doing what they claim they have done in terms of the Hamas infrastructure. You can go back to uh early december and see or november and see uh lloyd austin say um this doesn't look like it's gonna work and not and not he wasn't explicit about that he was just saying that you can have perhaps a tactical victory and not a strategic one yeah uh <laughs> because there has been clear from the beginning that no one thinks that they're going to be able to do whatever it is that they say that they can do uh, to Hamas. Um, and certainly, for every Hamas fighter they have killed, they are basically created a machine to create more Hamas fighters. Also, the idea that Hamas is part of some type of international access mm -hmm. uh, uh, from Iran... There's no doubt in my mind that Iran has provided some support, uh, not like the hundreds of millions of dollars that the Qataris have provided uh, with Israel's blessing. But the bottom line is, without the nationalistic aspirations, Hamas does not exist. Hamas is specific to uh, the Palestinian people in very in, in, in many ways specific to Gaza yeah and it came out of a nationalistic aspirational um, uh, uh, ideology and of course has been nurtured by Israel as a bulwark against the Fatah secular wing of I guess the Palestinian body politic netanyahu has bragged about bolstering hamas so this whole thing is just um it's is it's just ridiculous and you know and when he said like when he says it's not just he's right that the israeli people support this as you say but that's a part of the problem of why you can't really consider israel a democracy because there are millions of palestinians who don't have a say in this and that's by design because it's an ethno state right um they don't have a sovereignty and so israel controls their borders land and sea um and th they're able to inflict upon them whatever they wish and so like when he says there also that um that now there's plenty of room in the north of gaza that's true because like 80 percent of the homes have been either damaged or completely destroyed so there's a right. lot of room pick up your tent it's like how europe had a room after world war ii yeah but like he and the thinly veiled clash of civilization stuff he says there that's just like really far right fascist mythologizing of a massacre that you're trying to commit um and he's trying to make it about like a broader kind of you know a b broader battle of the west against the barbarism as he describes it and that's you know that's 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 at least a little bit more honest in what he's trying to achieve all right um in a moment we're going to be talking to laney newman research assistant at harvard law school author of rust belt union blues why working class voters are turning away from the democratic party 
uh, which he wrote with Theta uh, Scopel. We will get to that in just a moment. A couple of words from our sponsors today. Um, they're using the sports team. I mean, the, the, a lot of people talk in sports right now. Yeah. Um, if uh, supporting foundational health was a sport, you would want ritual on your team. Like I actually have. I mean, I don't really think about it as a team. <laughs> right. Team effort, but um, um, bad news bears of Sam's health. Exactly. <laughs> Although I think I'm doing. I, I. I mean, I'm. I think I'm doing all right. Frankly, uh, I'm feeling pretty healthy these days. Um, Ritual made essential for men a multivitamin that's uh, based solely on science and designed to help fill common nu nutrient gaps in the diet with 10 key nutrients. Uh, I uh, take uh, their, uh, their men over 50 uh, vitamin um, just because coincidentally, I am also uh, over 50. Over 50, wow. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then. it has made a, a big difference in the things that my, uh, doctor complains about when he takes my, uh, you know, you get a blood test every year and, uh, see where I'm deficient. It was all, it used to be vitamin D all the time. Not anymore. Um, because I don't go outside. 10 key nutrients in two delayed, uh, release capsules uh, per day, uh, to dissolve later in the small intestine, which is the optimal place to absorb nutrients. Um, it is also gentle on an empty stomach. They got a little uh, thing in the, in the bottle that uh, gives it a, 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 like a, like a minty uh, flavor. So you, taking your multivitamins is not um, a chore. But this is the thing for me. There are two elements about uh, Ritual that it makes sense actually with the name, I guess. But um, it was very easy for me to create a habit. But the biggest problem I've always had with multivitamins is, well, really two of them. One is uh, that I finish the bottle and then I forget to do it again. And then I'm like, oh, whatever. I mean, because I, I, I can never form the habit. The other is like, oh, I got to take these. Oh, wait, I haven't eaten. I don't want to feel nauseous. I got to wait. And then I forget to take it. And then mm. the, the whole rinse and repeat. Ritual takes care of both of these things. Um they, you can get them on a subscription service, and they'll send it to you uh, on a, uh, a basis so that, you know, when, you're, when your vitamins are about to run out, you get another bottle, and um, they're gentle on your stomach, so you can take them when you remember to take them. Plus, Ritual Vitamins are vegan, non-GMO pro uh, project verified. They're gluten and major allergen-free, certified B Corp, and made traceable. In other words, you can tell where uh, their elements are from and know that you're getting uh, the vitamins that are being sourced from places that have some type of protections uh, for things like your vitamins. Uh, Ritual uses scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainability sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. Ritual is a female-founded B Corp, which means that they're holding themselves accountable to not just their company's financial health, but also the health of people and our planet. Essential for Men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash majority. Start Ritual or add Essential for Men to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash majority for 20% off. Also, uh, sponsoring the program today, one of the big kicks I've made is try and get uh, rid of plastic in my, um, in my life, broadly speaking, so I get more like glass bottles for this type of stuff. And um, the other big thing is um, I don't want to take back all these plastic bottles of uh, cleaning products. Um, Americans throw away 25% more trash from Thanksgiving to New Year's. Um, this year, let's try and uh, uh, drop that uh, number, particularly in terms of plastic. The, the amount of plastic that's produced, like something like, what's a huge, like 30% of all plastic that's in like the universe was like produced in the past like five, 10 years. Oh. It's insane. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet with the same powerful clean you're used to. The idea is simple. They offer refillable cleaning products with a beautiful, cohesive design that looks great on your counter. 
could fill your reusable fill your reusable bottles with water, drop in the tablets, wait for them to dissolve. You'll never have to grab bulky cleaning supplies on your grocery run. Refill start at just two twenty five. You can even set up a subscription or buy in bulk for additional savings. They've got cleaning sprays, hand soaps, toilet bowl cleaner, laundry tablets. All Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients you can feel good about. Blue Land is trusted in over 1 million homes, including mine. They don't mention, for me, I mean, I use the uh, toilet uh, bowl cleaner instead of like having the squeeze ball. You drop in a thing, let it dissolve, use it to clean your things. Um, for me, the big thing is dishwashing. Oh, yeah. They have like a tin that is about, I don't know, it's about yay big and just a bunch of tablets in there. They're not wrapped in plastic. You're not getting that plastic chemical stuff all over your plates. Uh, it is just a tablet. And you drop the tablet in and they work really, really well. Sometimes you get like the dishwashing stuff that gives you the white film and yeah, this and that. Yeah, it nope. doesn't do that. And I got a crappy dishwasher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, mine is like, apartment life. it's a very old dishwasher. Um, Blue Land has a special for our offer for our listeners right now. Get 15% off your first order by going to blueland.com slash majority. If you don't want to, you don't want to miss this folks, blueland.com slash majority, 15% off. That's blueland.com slash majority. Get 15% off. We will put the, uh, links to the, uh, uh, these offers in the podcast and YouTube and, uh, descriptions and at majority.fm uh quick break then we'll be talking to laney newman research assistant at a harvard law school author of rust belt <laughs> union blues why working class voters are turning away from the democratic party she wrote with theta scopel we'll be right back <laughs> We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. A real pleasure to welcome to the program Lainey Newman, research assistant at Harvard Law School, author of Rust Belt Union Blues, Why Working Class Voters Are Turning Away from the Democratic Party, written with uh, Theta Scopel, who I believe we've had on at least once or twice in the past. Uh, Lainey, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, let's start with... Um, the uh, this is basically uh, uh, like a combination of an ethnography and uh, sort of a, a social um, uh, research. Just give us a sense, uh, uh, just so we have a uh, before we get into actual the content. Like what what was involved in uh, in your research here? Yeah, sure. So um, you're right. It is sort of the combination of an ethnographic study and uh, sort of more of a social science academic. Um, uh, project and what most of the research involved was um, interview uh, interview data um, and archival data that we sort of compiled and looked at trends um, to sort of get a sense of you know what was changing over time. Um, I interviewed a lot of retired union members and current union members in the Western Pennsylvania region, and then I also visited several archives as well as local unions um, and looked at records and documents. Um, including newsletters over time um, to sort of get a sense of uh, how people were um, 
how, how the unions were sort of portraying issues and what they were talking about uh, and communicating with their members. Um, and then finally, we did do, you know, ethnographic research, which part of which was the whole bumper sticker um, analysis and looking at, you know, union members, uh, bumper stickers and employee parking lots uh, at the steel mills. Um, and then also just sort of going around and, and taking pictures of some of these old steel towns in, in Western Pennsylvania. And we should say this is, um, you know, uh, more or less your uh, hometown area, or at least uh, 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 adjacent to. And some of the people you started off interviewing were uh, family members, uh, and then uh, you expanded as you needed to to get, um, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, less self-selected uh, uh, groups of people in some way. But l for for folks who don't know, what what is the Rust Belt? Yeah, sure. I mean, so the Rust Belt, I think it's kind of an amorphous term, but I think it generally re refers to the industrial Midwest, um, this sort of aggregate of, uh, you know, of um, heavy industry or ex-industry uh, areas uh, um, in sort of the upper Midwest, Pennsylvania, parts of New York, um, uh, Buffalo, um, Ohio, Illinois, Minnesota, Michigan. Um, and areas that I think generally have seen a um, decline in, in economic uh, activity uh, in manufacturing as heavy industry has sort of left the U.S. Um, and, and been consolidated. Um, but yeah, I think it stretches. It's, you know, uh, it's a little bit hard to define geographically, but it's generally within that, that region. And, and, and also just so that we have both parts, I guess, of the title um, uh, uh, defined, when we're talking about union, you're, you're looking at specific types of unions here. Uh, 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 tell us what those unions are. Yeah, we looked at mostly um, unions that have historically been manufacturing or, or industrial unions. Um, and then we also looked at some of the trade unions, um, trade unions being historically the craft union. So um, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers or bricklayers, um, uh, insulators, uh, sort of those were the historically the AFL. Um, and then the indus industry or the manufacturing unions, um, the auto workers, the steel workers, the miners, um, these large CIO unions that um, now have really expanded beyond those initial uh, original industries. So, you know, steel workers no longer only represent people in steel mills, but also, um, you know, nurses and, and librarians and, um, and others. But historically, those, those unions that were, that were focused on and, and re representing um, manufacturing workers and industry uh, workers. And why that cohort? Um, I think that, uh, so for, you know, uh, Back to what you initially said, I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh and, and th this was, those were the unions sort of in this area, really active in this area. And I think we wanted to look at um, this changing, the changing political uh, outlooks of people who historically were members of unions and had that as a driving force in their political ideology. Um, and so, you know, I, there's been a lot of work done on um, sort of quote unquote the white working class. Um, we wanted to look at a subset of what a lot of people have historically considered to be part of the the working class, which is you know blue collar union members. Um, and within that, most of you know the 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 um, quintessential or sort of archetypal um, union man was this industry or manufacturing worker um, in in these industrial regions and, and sort of looking at the political evolution of that particular population was, was really interesting to us. What I found really interesting too, was this, um, and I guess it was maybe around, I, I want to say the, the, the nineties or the, the, the early two thousands, maybe there was a lot of talk about the loss of a third place and uh, the third place being we had work, we have home. And then there's a sort of like a place where people would socialize. And um, talk about the role that unions played in these workers' lives, because in some level it was a, a like a rolling third place, or specifically like an actual third place, uh, being these union halls, and and then also sort of um, uh, uh, the the you know ethnic sort of like g group halls. Right. Uh, explain that for us. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so this, you know, this part of the research really built off of Professor Scotch Pole and, and Robert Putnam and, uh, you know, previous sociologists that have documented the decline of, of civic associations in the U.S. Um, but I think with unions particularly, uh, 
unions had this sort of um, really interesting place in community life. Um, they were institutions that brought people together, that brought workers together in the workplace, but also outside of the workplace. And that's something that I think that the scholarship um, has underemphasized uh, up until this point. Um, and the role that they played outside of the workplace was was really broad, actually. So they um, not only were involved, you know, in, in sort of collective bargaining or, you know, political activity and in, in, in getting their members to vote for, you know, whatever candidate, but also in organizing community events and working with other local organizations and in, in being involved in religious affairs and in, in communities. Um, they also, you know, were, um, they, you know, uh, I guess, were, had a really big role to play in providing information um, and news to, uh, to members. So they, you know, um, local unions sent newsletters to, to members, um, international unions sent magazines to members, and then in many places there were even labor newspapers that were funded by um, some, of the, some of the unions uh, together. And so I think that um, unions now have been sort of cabined into, you know, this sort of economic sphere, but historically speaking, um, in the mid 20th century, being a, a union man or a union family was not um, was not limited to the workplace. It really did uh, span um, across all different parts of people's lives, um, and that's something that we we tried to highlight in in the book. It, it, it's like basically constituted the social life in, in many respects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, l let's talk about the the numbers. I mean, of well, I, and, and is there any way to like? sort of identify like how how people have identified themselves like would people like, it seems to me just anecdotally that in 1950 or you know 60 maybe you could find one of uh these guys more often than not guys in the const in, in the context of, of of these unions in particular um who would say like if you asked them like within a very quick uh, amount of time in a conversation would identify themselves as a union guy as yeah. opposed to a union guy today where that may not come up right until deep deep into a conversation is there any data in terms of the way that like people you know I identified themselves and and how much of that became you know that we perceive of like identity politics like that's what like that's that was just a uh, that was a shifting identity, I guess. Yeah, no, exactly. And I I wish that there was a data set that sort of looked that looked at that. Um, I think you know what we tried to do is is look at what how people we actually looked in the records of you know um, for the term union man um, in newsletters and in um, convention reports and and whatnot conference reports um, and looked at how the union man was 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 being talked about in what capacity what that really meant to people um, and I think that what you're getting at is is exactly right that that it was much more salient to workers in you know in the mid 20th century um, their membership to the union than to many workers today um, when you know the being a member of a union isn't necessarily something that is a defining you know characteristic for for them in their social or political or even their self you know self identity um and so i think that that has to do with the extent to which um unions in the in the past sort of really integrated themselves into workers and families and communities lives um and were not only sort of circumscribed to um being a collective bargaining unit but were really part of um, how people identified themselves. And we we talk about, um, you know, there's some really great examples in in the records of, you know, um, older members saying, you know, my my most prized possession is is my union card and and you know this this union is you know just essentially things that that are make clear how important it was um, to people that they were uh, that they were union union members. And I think that 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 salience of being a union man, being a union woman, being a union family is something that's um, that's that's gone down over time and the the ability for the union to have this kind of uh social uh be a part of the social fabric right i mean that has to do i would imagine with uh, the resources that they had at the time in part due to the fact that they probably had such high numbers right i mean w it's a chicken or the egg situation but but, mm -hmm. but if you could talk about that dynamic uh historically 
Yeah, no, completely. And I think I think that the decline in resources and um, and in member you know membership uh, density really um, was was a huge blow to the ability of of unions to to maintain this sort of deep level of community engagement. There were also changing legal rules and, and you know, sort of um, a lot of efforts from uh, <laughs> various conservative entities to sort of circumscribe unions into this, this particular sphere. Um, and so declining, declining dues, um, declining membership, these really significant blows to industry and manufacturing in the mid or in the late, I guess, seven, in the 70s and 80s, um, and the, the collapse of the steel industry, you know, in particular, um, I think took a lot of, you know, at first it, at first it resulted in um, everyone coming together and, and being, you know, sort of trying to, to save industry and, and, and support one another. And then eventually because of, you know, loss after loss, uh, you know, eventually led to, to people disintegrating. Um, and the sort of remnants of, of um, uh, in in the Rust Belt of uh, of those union of the historic you know the industrial unions, um, because of the numbers you know, lower numbers of people because of the lower numbers of of dues money and and these other issues, um, there it's much more difficult I think now to to fully integrate into the social and community lives. Um, you can't support uh, like a, a nice union hall right. with like a, I don't know with a kegerator if you don't have enough mo uh, members essentially who exactly. are going to be there. All right, yeah. before we get to like the relationship with the Democratic Party and how that sort of like um, it, it mixes, well, let's just also talk about uh, the what happens when that third place, either as an actual place or as a, a you know, speaking as like a psychographic, uh, you know, entity, which one identifies with and where one goes to sort of get, you know, support and community and whatnot what happens when that goes away i mean because there was a quote in, in 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 your book something to the effect of like uh the uh, about a guy who had been like if it wasn't for the union the guy would have probably been in the kkk um yeah. uh, talk about that dynamic because that void gets filled in some way right 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 yeah i mean exactly and i think that i think it's um you know it's human nature to to seek community it's uh to seek a sense of belonging and and that sort of need doesn't doesn't go away um when when unions do um and so you know when when unions are no longer there i think in a, in a lot of respects unions were um providing a counterweight to a lot of the more conservative um socially conservative you know political politically conservative um, narratives uh, that were that have always been out there, right? But um, like what you were just saying, the quote that you just mentioned, um, the member that said that if it weren't for being a mine worker, a member of the United Mine Workers, that he would have been in the KKK. Um, the obviously, you know, uh, <laughs> problematic in in many regards, but that the union was playing was was providing this sort of community sense of community and sense of belonging for that person and. and and a counterweight, um, sorry, a counterweight no to um, to more conservative, in, socially conservative, and and clearly, um, you know, really prejudiced influences. Um, and so I think that what you have when that goes away is is just the, you know, the the filling of that void with with more of that um, of those of those voices uh, and of those groups and and. Um, we talk a little bit in the book about the the role of the social role of gun clubs now in a lot of these um, industrial or ex-industrial regions, um, and uh, that the that the presence in in and influences in in these regions is almost entirely and exclusively um, conservative in nature in terms of what those community organizations are are sort of promoting, um, and so there's no counterweight anymore, which I think is 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 part of the problem. Can you also talk about like you bring up uh, in the book, um, and and I guess this is also sort of like generational, right? Like like how far away you get from your parents being first generation immigrants, but the existence and uh, I'm you know in this area in particular, I think like uh, Polish social clubs, Lithuanian social clubs. Um, uh, these type of of organizations and how sort of like the union affiliation and socialization that happens around that 
those conversations also sort of like uh, happen in these sort of adjacent spaces. And yeah. it, it just becomes like a way of, it, it becomes like, this is the way that like culture and, and ideas spread. We, we, you talk yeah. about that, that, that uh, relationship. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, all of these institutions and sort of the networks that people had, um, we find, you know, really impacted one another. And so um, conversations and, and sort of identity being built and and undergirded by, by union membership wasn't limited to, you know, only happening at the union hall, but people were also interacting with um, their, you know, their, their coworkers or, you know, their, their union peers um, at other institutions in the community, um, like the ethnic clubs, like smaller religious organizations, um, and even even um, gun clubs and rifle clubs that have always existed in most of these areas. Um, so some of my retirees told me, you know, they would go up to the shooting range, you know, with with friends, and that that was you know what they did on on the weekends or or what have you. Um, but the difference, I think, is that uh, you know. When when there's when when the union has a role to play in the community as 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 a key institution um, and is hosting, for example, you know, coin trading events, which is you know, I'm just thinking of, of some of the um, newsletters we went through, or or you know, sponsoring a, a derby, so you know, soapbox derby or whatever. Um, the the um, exactly like culture is sort of built on, and 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 um, those those. Even even though it's not expressly stated that the union is um, you know promoting sort of certain political ideals, it's 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 sort of infil it's you know it goes throughout the 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 forum or the exchange of, of social conversation, and um, that's a it's a very different picture when the backdrop is um, an NRA affiliated gun club that doesn't you know and there's no sort of presence or counterweight um of of you know that that expresses a more progressive stance on issues and expresses um you know uh you know values of of, of working class coalition building so um I, I do think that the fact that the union was unions were local unions were very integrated with all of these institutions meant that not only was the union influence limited to the actual union hall or or workplace but it you know in these other places where members were socializing with other members those peer-to-peer -peer, um sort of uh relationships strengthened and that actually helped you know preserve that the influence of the union how, how much of the nature of unions to trains either sort of uh consciously or sort of unconsciously its members to expand it their i don't want to say proselytizing but like if you're in an organization that is fundamentally democratic and you, th that is involved in sort of like you, you know group power and empowering each other and built to support and you're providing like i pay dues so that you know if if uh, you know uh, we go out on strike you're also uh being able to support your mom who's sick or that type of thing like how much of the nature of a union, as opposed to, let's say, I'm a, you know, I don't know, a, a member of like a, a, a Lego club or what, I don't know what would, would supply, how much of that actually sort of implicates their ability to influence the community outside of the parameters of the union? Yeah. Um, so I think I think what you're getting at is sort of the difference between the union being, you know, having an underlying political m message and and sort of underlying political uh, sort of outlook as opposed to being a completely neutral, um, you know, organization or civic organization. Like, you know, is, is that what you're sort of saying? If I'm yeah. I mean, not just like politics in terms of ideology, but almost in practice, like the relationship between, you know, uh, you know, uh, union members, um, even on its surface can look maybe like I belong to, I don't know, the Rotary Club. Yeah. Um, but in the way that they interact, it creates a different way of interacting with other people. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? So, so like the, the structure of the union in and of itself yeah. is, I guess it's praxis on some level. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think that th that's something that I think the peer to peer and like member to member connections were really what 
um, drove the the sort of identity behind being like a democratic, um, you know, a political member of the union, whatever that meant. And and and, so, and something that I think this really of is is um, that you know the peer connections, at least in our perspective, were much more important historically than um, you know this these top down political messages. Um, and so in sort of in the sense of you know that these relationships are praxis, I guess, what I think of is, you know, they they reinforced themselves, um, if that makes sense. So like the political messaging came from within. Um, it was really a, a sort of a grassroots um, identity as opposed to being, you know, as opposed to, I guess, the, the, the you know, the top union officials saying vote for this guy, um, which historically, I mean, we, we now know based on polling data that you know, union members and um, you know don't really like when they're the president tells them who to vote for. But that's always been the case. We found you know research or data from from the mid '50s saying we don't really want the top union guys to be you know of the international union to tell us how to vote. Um, and yet every you know sort of the, the 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 basis of people's political sort of outlooks were were. Um, uh, sort of reinforced by you know their peers and by by the by you know the community that they were part of as opposed to um, sort of the top down um, at the, at that time. Let's talk about the relationship with the Democratic Party. So this um, what what happens first? Like there is you know we. Uh, there, there's this notion that the sort of the Democratic Party abandoned um, uh, uh, working class people or union people. And, and certainly in the wake of like uh, the the way that um, uh, primaries were restructured under the uh, McGovern Commission this prior to him running for, for office, they basically said, we're not going to allow the unions to sort of sit in the back room and we're, we're going to actually have primaries, which are going to allow people to vote. That obviously uh, undercut, and, and and there was a, and Jimmy Carter was, uh, you know, I think more hostile to unions than he gets credit for uh, at this point. But um, what was what was the beginning of uh, of the end here, particularly in this? Obviously, we're talking about these unions. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, sort of going back to the chicken or the egg problem, um, <laughs> but I, I do think that. Um, the 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 beginning of the end was i think some conscious decisions on the part of policymakers including democrats to um sort of to 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 not invest or or um prioritize other other issues other you know other groups potentially um in this i would say say around the the 60s late 60s and 70s um particularly the 70s and i do agree that i think you know carter and um, the Carter administration, I think, was was a sort of a, a, a key turning point um, for for this population of, of union members, particularly. Um, and I think that you know, uh, in the in the seventies and eighties, when when steel was really struggling, um, there were many calls for for. Uh, the steel industry to be bailed out or to be, you know, sort of supported um, by the government, and uh, those in the way that the 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 Obama administration right. did with uh, the car companies, essentially, exactly. in, in the wake of the financial crisis. Exactly, and so uh, you know, and Carter Carter rejected those calls, and I think that you know the the different you know, like it's hard to imagine the counterfactual, of course, but um, it's you know it. it I think that things would be different if if that decision had been the reverse. Um, and there was a sense of that this was inevitable, that, you know, these, you know, we were moving towards a, you know, a sort of service-based economy and knowledge-based economy, um, that manufacturing was was inevitably going to to leave the US. Um, but those decisions and, and inaction by policymakers was really, really important, I think, um, in this whole story and, and, and this trajectory. Um, and so that's what I would sort of pinpoint for for the beginning of the end. Uh, it's the um, uh, the Atari Democrats. I can't remember. Uh, she, she wrote that book, but it was we could see that in in Massachusetts in the context of the um, uh, 128 uh, or 495, I guess, beltway of mm. uh, of growth of 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 uh, knowledge professionals, as it were. Uh, what's right. it? 
Lily Geismer. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, uh, so let's, so what, uh, and then once that starts there, like what, it, it just becomes a sort of, uh, I guess a, a feedback loop. The, the idea becomes that, uh, unions are becoming less relevant to Democrats. So they become, so Democrats become less relevant to unions. Uh, and all of this sort of, um, the, the union density diminishes like tremendously over the course of 50 years. Um, and there's nothing to replace it except for, I guess, Fox TV and, uh, gun clubs and, and, and whatnot that, I mean, that's the, that seems to be the sort of like overarching story. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that, I think that you know, over the, over, you know, throughout the eighties, uh, a lot of, so even some of my interviewees assumed that, um, you know, Reagan had won the, the, the Western Pennsylvania region, um, in the eighties, which isn't true. I mean, I think that, you know, unions sort of union power held on, um, for, for a while, but I, and in part, you know, sort of galvanized by this idea of, you know, saving itself. Um, and unfortunately over time that, that really sort of, died off because, you know, there was so much loss. Um, and as union density has decreased, as dues has, you know, have, have sort of have decreased. Um, and importantly, as, as sort of these big industrial unions that used to represent a certain, you know, identity of, of people in heavy industry or manufacturing have diversified, um, people's sort of relationship to the union in these original industries has, has, sort of just lost salience. Um, and, and you're right that there's not much to replace it with in terms of a progressive counterweight to, um, you know, all of these conservative messages that people hear from Fox news, from the NRA, um, and, and that type of thing. What, 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 where, where's race in all of this? Like what, you know, the, um, uh, one of the stories that, uh, I feel like, um, I've heard, for a while is that the um the the loss of of union support was a function of the democratic party in the you know mid to late 60s becoming more focused on emancipatory movements of of black people of women of <clears throat> of uh you know minorities or i guess marginalized uh, people in general <clears throat> Where, wh wh where does that story fit into the work you've done here? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, I think that uh, that claim. So I think we we kind of disagree with the with the claim that um, it had to be an either or type thing. Um, so you know, I think that there was a huge a huge um, sort of transition in the 60s. I don't think anyone would disagree with that on, on the priorities of the, the Democratic Party. Um, but I think that, you know, I mean, the power of unions in terms of um, equalizing, you know, racial racial pay gaps, uh, decreasing racial resentment between Americans um, has been, you know, is, is, is very clear. Uh, and there were, um, you know, there's in people of color and, and when workers of color were being hugely benefited by unions. I mean, we talk a little bit in the book about um, how the black middle class was, was grown and built on um, via unions in, in some parts of the, of the Rust Belt. Um, and so I think that, I think that sort of set, you know, separating these two concepts of either, you know, we can sort of advance these equality notions or, you know, support labor. Um, is is kind of a, a narrative that we've chosen to buy into, as opposed to something that was um, necessary at the time, or that you know maybe was you know even true at the time of a lot of policymakers that were that were trying to do both. But in the end, it does seem that you know the, the sort of the choice um, that policies that sort of promoted the promoted equality were. Um, given priority, and 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 that's you know that that makes sense in a lot of ways. But I do think that they you know they can both coexist at the same time, um, and, and one doesn't have to mean the loss of the other. Do you have a sense of if the um, 
diminishment of unions and union density um, had an inverse relationship to sort of racial attitudes? I mean, because we're dealing with like, you know, um, obviously post uh, Civil Rights Act um, uh, and, and LBJ, you know, famously said, I'm going to lose the South for generations. And Western Pennsylvania is not necessarily the south although i've heard people describe uh you know uh pennsylvania is like you know philadelphia and pittsburgh and then alabama in the middle type of thing um yeah. and uh like how much was unionizing um sort of a a mitigating factor in the some uh in 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 races uh, racist tendencies or racism I think hugely. I mean, hugely. I um, we talked to actually a lot of interviewees about this. Uh, you know, both white and black interviewees, um, and current and former members. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, the the research shows there's been some research done on this that, statistically speaking, it, you know, it's clear that racial resentment does go down um, when given union given you know unions presence. Um, but I also think that you know, just in terms of um, exposure to, to people who aren't like oneself um, and, and working with people of different races, um, being in the same, on the same, you know, team, um, quote unquote, uh, as, you know, as people of other races. Um, and in this, you know, sort of extends as well to gender at a certain point. Um, the, the beginning of, of uh, you know, the, the, these integration movements were, of course, were hugely difficult um, for the people who were, you know, in these spaces. But um, I do think that there was a, a, a massive amount of progress made in unions. I mean, unions came out very much in support of um, the civil rights movement, even if the local level weren't, lo local level unions weren't, you know, as supportive. Um, the overall stance of the union, I think, really did make a difference and, and did sort of, in the end, um, win the day. And I think um, people I talk to, um, both current and former members, uh, just have t have talked very frankly about the role that you know unions have played in in understanding one another and in feeling like you know they're on the same side of things and that the person down the line from them is you know it doesn't matter who they are it doesn't matter what they look like but they're you know um, one person said like when your life is in the hands of the guy down, you know, down the line, you know, that person's a brother to you no matter what. And so like, I think, I think that's the general idea that, you know, people, it's a exposure and being on the same side as, as, as others is, um, is one of the things that unions did uh, to, to reduce racial antagonism. This may be a little bit out of the scope. It's certainly outside the scope of the, the, this particular research, but is our, are, are there areas or other unions where this um, dynamic of, of union identity, union life, like becoming, uh, you know, becoming a, a new third place, you know, at least if not literally a uh, place, but sort of uh, psych psychically or psychologically, I guess. I mean, is there, uh, do you see that happening in other areas uh, today? other unions, other, uh, other sort of like union sectors? That's a good question. Um, I mean, one thing that we, that we talk a bit about in the book is the, the sort of, um, the craft unions that have done a slightly, uh, m you know, maybe better job, um, of maintaining a sense of union identity, um, than some this of This is the comparing the steel workers to the electric, uh, uh Yeah, workers. to the electrical workers, to the IBEW. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that that's based on our finding that, you know, the, the craft unions have, um, largely kept to their, to their original industry and, and the, the industrial unions have largely, um, diversified uh, beyond their original in industry. Um, and I think that the craft unions also had, um, they sort of um, are often the hiring halls for members um, and, and members are on projects, uh, at least in the case of the IBEW that then end and then, you know, sort of, so the, 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 the union itself is the, um, 
sort of de facto employer, um, you know, the consistent employer, and then and then they go out on projects. And because of that dynamic, there's it's less um, place based and less sort of like uh, um, the union had to find other ways to sort of reach out to members to to coalesce members to create a community, um, and so sort of. Um, innovative communication techniques emerged and, um, you know, getting together, you know, and keeping in touch with, with members in different places and, and organizing events in different places. Um, and so I think that that model has, has potentially survived in, in, in a slightly more effective way. Um, but I also think that, you know, a lot of the service unions um, have been doing, you know, are just are on the forefront and, and have been doing a lot of interesting work. And, and that's not, it's not to say that the industrial unions haven't as well. I mean, I think that there's a lot going on in labor right now um, that's very exciting, but um, I, I would say that sort of maintaining that historical model of, of being able to communicate and, and maintain relations despite being, you know, separated geographically, I think has, has sort of um, has been effective over time. Are you seeing any of that? I mean, we have like a sort of a revived UAW, it, it feels like at least, uh, one that's getting a lot more aggressive and, and trying to unionize other places and sort yeah. of amongst teachers uh, as well, it feels like over the past decade. Um, these, are, these aren't necessarily, I mean, maybe the UAW is a little closer uh, to, to the steel workers than the teachers, but um, uh, are you, you seeing sort of those techniques uh, applied there? Or the, again, this might be outside of your... Yeah, uh, I mean... Yeah, I think the UAW is is a really interesting example going on, really fascinating right now. Um, and I do think that they've they've used some of these techniques to to maintain communication and relations between people. Um, I also think that, I mean, President Sean Fain of the UAW has done a really good job of, um, I think, reconnecting the union to various identity strands um, in, in people, um, and and sort of grabbing onto the sense of uh, of of us versus them that I think a lot of unions used to really take advantage of. Um, and so, I mean, I do think that 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 the UAW and maybe the teachers, I'm not as familiar with the teachers, but um, have been have been taking these techniques and and sort of propelling them into the future. Um, uh, lastly, uh, I, I think you, if I remember correctly, and I may if i'm if I'm not remembering correctly, forgive me, but I think you did some work around, like I think it was in the wake of the twenty twenty election or the twenty two election about what was happening with uh, Pennsylvania suburban women uh, in some of that reach. Uh, I'm just curious as you look into this coming election, where what do you think is going to be the story one way or another in terms of like, specific cohorts and uh and turnout and and who's energized in a way that like um you know maybe it was 2018 i mean there was a lot of like groups of voters who were um maybe they would vote but they weren't quite as engaged as they were in the wake of like uh, the trump uh, uh presidency and certainly i would imagine now there's a whole nother you know sort of like equality to this because of uh the the repeal of uh, roe v wade but do you uh have a sense of what might be that story this this cycle um in pennsylvania specifically i mean i think i it's yeah it's hard to say i mean i i worry a lot about young voters right now um i think that's that's something that uh is on everyone's minds um potentially um, but in, in Pennsylvania, I mean, I think, I think that the, the work that the Biden administration has done on, um, labor related issues on infrastructure, I, I'm, I'm hoping that that will be, you know, enough to get some of the, um, you know, swing voters or, or women, uh, middle, middle of the road voters, even moderate Republicans potentially, um, to, to come out and vote. I mean, one of the things that we talk about a lot in our book is that, um, it's not as easy as, you know, coming around just during an election cycle and trying to ask for people's votes. <laughs> it takes a lot more long-term work and long-term, uh, you know, movement building and community outreach um, than that. And so, uh, you know, I think that the, the Democrats have a long way to go in, in, in rebuilding in, in a lot of these areas and it, take, it, would, it will take a significant investment. Um, but I am hopeful that some of these, you know, 
um, some of the policies that the Biden administration has worked on, uh, which I do think has been, you know, have been they has they've done a lot, um, and I think I, they don't get enough credit for for a lot of the policy I think that they that they've worked on. Um, so hopefully that will sort of swing swing enough people in in Pennsylvania. Well, um, Lainey Newman, research assistant at Harvard Law School, uh, author of Rust Belt Union Blues: Why Working Class Voters Are Turning Away from the Democratic Party, written with uh, Theda Scotchball. Um, Thank you so much for your time today. We will put a link uh, to your book at uh, majority.fm and in the podcast and YouTube descriptions. Really interesting stuff. Great. Thank you so much, Sam and Emma. Thank you so much. All right, folks. We're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the fun half of the program, wherein there'll be a little bit of just fair warning. So much fun. Uh, so fun. much fun. Lighthearted. Also, little bit of uh, uh, um, talk about uh, football, but... Uh, no, I'll save that mostly for ESPN today, which That's is, right. Well, uh, we'll talk about the PSYOPs uh, element of it. Certainly. Um, we got to prepare, yeah, help the population the, react to the PSYOP they just underwent. Yeah, the deep state... Deep, let's deprogram our And audience. Biden uh, couldn't have been more clever in the whole way that they did this thing. He did tweet out a dark Brandon meme uh, oh. as... Um, as Rafa was getting pummeled. That was off. referring to the Super Bowl, am I understand? Yes, because after the Chiefs won, it was like... It, but it, was, it coincided with the passing of a bunch of military aid and the bombing of Rafa, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what... Like, we drew it up. I mean... Psycho. Well, they whoever was doing the social media thought that they were focused on the whole, like... Uh, Super Bowl. Thing. I mean, look at look at how. Also, they're using that. What is that? Biden's two thousand eight like inauguration yeah, photo wow. from, from as he looks very different now. Well, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, my uh, Twitter uh, picture is, is like I think uh, forty years old. I think it's I think it's my high school yearbook. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, you got a still from Sex in the City. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, Folks, just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the free show free of commercials, but you also get the fun half. You can IM us on the fun half. And uh, you make sure that this show survives and thrives. We've had a bunch of good interviews. January and February is like a peak interview time for us. It was last year as well. Um People are already talking about, like, take some time off over the summer and do some best ofs. We'll see. We'll see mean, about that. We'll see. <laughs> I know the day that we take off. Uh, I know exactly what happens. The question is, which one of the candidates passes away? Right. I guess it's about to say. <laughs> Both Trump and Biden have heart attacks the same day, <laughs> the like, same like, day. like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Except for they'd be holding hands. I want them to be holding hands when that happens. Oh, when Biden dies, his last words are, at least Trump lives. <laughs> Thank you. I was confused. Oh, God. <laughs> that's what. That's the fable, right? Who who died first? No, the, oh, I don't know about... Like, they died on the same day, though. And at that time, like, who knows? Right. I mean, you know. Adam's the same Adam. time is, like, within a 14-day period. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> the same like, week. Exactly. Like, they... <laughs> That how long that's that that's how long it takes. Um, also, folks, justcoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee and hot chocolate. You can also buy the majority report blend. You gotta buy a bunch of the other blends. Justcoffee.coop. It's a co-op. They're in Madison, Wisconsin. They're great. And it's all fair trade. I heard so. the discount code doesn't work on the Marin blend though, so that's not true. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> But I mean, woe is those who those who try. Yes, uh, on that blend. Just coffee dot co-op. Um, ESVN. Any news? Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about the big game. All right. That's. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna I wax poetically about Patrick Mahomes. I've I don't know if there's like a more 
It, well, I don't think you wax poetically about it. I think you just wax. I do. I do just wax. Yeah, I don't know how much poetry will be involved, but like I, I, I we're in. I mean, this is Michael Jordan territory of clutchness. This is okay. Another, relax. I'm not. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. I am not. Like Brady won Super Bowl MVP his first year, and he threw for like what 147 yards or something like that. Like I, 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 I this is like a level of. The game runs through him. It's always him making the big plays. I I've never seen anything like it. So YouTube.com. You were born in what, like 96? Yeah, yeah, it was 94. Class. Look at his doc. And <laughs> I mean, I was there for Michael Jordan, so. Yeah, well, but you don't watch football. You saw Wizards Michael Jordan. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, that's true. That's true. I watched The Last Dance. I, I got the Oh, yeah, I got that was just energy. like being there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why? I don't think I've ever seen you like this. This is a ageism. Well, uh, actually, reverse ageism. Exactly. No, by you. Um, uh, uh, left <laughs> Reckoning, um, David Griscom and I down. reviewed a New York Times uh, podcast called Hard Fork, uh, where a New York Times reporter confronted a Bitcoin venture capitalist or a crypto venture capitalist about, hey, you told me this was a real thing, and years later, like, nothing has come out of that do you have any sort of uh, 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 thing to say about that and he's like well actually just give it a little bit <laughs> there's yeah. some stuff coming up uh, so, I thought uh, he was gonna say like I got something else for you to get into well there's also like we're kind of pivoting to AI but also there's some blockchain things that come up but also um, yeah we get into um, uh, New York Times broadly so yeah uh, patreon.com is left reckoning to get David and David Griscom and my Marxist podcast reviews folks See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, you're back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! What a fucking nightmare! What a nightmare! Can you bring back DJ yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Dan. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Oh. Snowflake says what? 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 